Hi, my name is Christy, and this is the American Chinese Food Show, where we analyze historical artifacts like vintage menus, recipe books, photographs, and text to tell the story of American Chinese food. So China is huge. Who were the sixty-something thousand people that went to the United States by 1870? Where were they from originally? According to a travel log published in 1877, of the total of 152,000 belonging to a regional association in the United States, over 70% of them are from a region called Xi, of which three quarters are specifically from Taishan, in Xi. Let's zoom in. We start with China, then we have southern China, the Guangdong Province, Jiangmen City. A.K.A. Xi or Seyap in Cantonese region. Yi or Yap means county. So within Xi region, there were four counties: Xinhui, Anping, Kaiping, and Taishan. The terminology on city, county, and region is a bit fuzzy, especially because Xi is now Yi,、uh, which is five counties.、Um, but I hope you get the gist. Let's look at some first-hand records. Xi Tu Mei Tang was born in a small village in Kaiping, Guangdong Province. We got to get a peek into what the journey was like for Chinese to travel thousands of miles to the United States from his memoir. I took the big steamer from Hong Kong to the United States in March 1880. I was 14. When it was my turn to go to the United States, overseas Chinese were no longer coolies sold to hard labor. Those before me established shops and formed Chinatown. I was on a much bigger Western ship. It was fifty-three silver coins for a ticket from Hong Kong to San Francisco. It was a lot of money. Those who went had to borrow money from family, mortgage their properties, or sell their land. It would take years to pay the debt. Why did the Chinese go to the United States? At the time, the Qing Dynasty's feudal exploitation and imperial financial aggression forced my fellow compatriots along the ocean to leave our country to look for a living. There was no work and no land to farm in our hometowns, and we heard about this golden mountain in the United States, where we could make thirty silver coins per month. So more and more people went. Let's break down this really loaded paragraph piece by piece to illustrate how bad the living situation was. The Chinese in Guangdong by the ocean already had an established pattern of leaving China to work in other parts of the world. To the rest of Chinese in China today, according to some internet forums, the Cantonese is perceived as being practical, especially financially, gritty, flexible, and adventurous. I am Cantonese, and my ancestors are from Kaiping. I hope I can say this without getting into trouble. Life was getting hard with the combination of natural and man-made disasters. From 1851 to 1908, in just 57 years, there were 14 floods, seven typhoons, four earthquakes, four epidemics. Two droughts and five famines in Taishan only. The first Opium War fought from 1839 to 1842 between Qing China and Great Britain, concluded by the Treaty of Nanking, where China established five treaty ports: in Shanghai, Guangdong, Ningbo, Fuzhou, and Xiamen. The Taiping Heavenly Kingdom was an Oppositional state in China from the 1850s, trying to overthrow the Qing Dynasty. At its height, the Heavenly Kingdom controlled South China, centered on the Yangtze River Valley, and took control of Tianjin, where the Qing Emperor was forced to flee. But then the Heavenly Kingdom boasted some two million followers. The Taiping Rebellion that lasted from 1850 to 1864, resulting in 30 to 50 million dead, began in Guangxi. Guangdong was not part of the rebellion. Then why am I mentioning them? Well, because all of the events are related. While the Qing court was super busy fighting back the Taiping Rebellion after、um, the First Opium War. 
The Red Turban Rebellion broke in the Guangdong province in 1854 by members of the Heaven and Earth Society. They were also an important early ally of the Taipings. They began capturing county-level cities in the summer of 1854. The Qing court was able to defend the provincial city of Guangzhou alongside the British Royal Navy, which intervened on the government side. Nonetheless, the Heaven and Earth Society continued to fight through much of the country for more than a year, with some consolidating with the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. Some of the Heaven and Earth Society later became triads. Organized crime syndicates, but that's for maybe a later video if I can find anything about it related to American Chinese food. The Red Turban Rebellion, while unsuccessful, had an impact on two historical events that made the lives of those who lived in the Guangdong Province worse. First, the Second Opium War. Because of the British involvement, Chinese ships carrying British weaponry sold to the Qing government used the British flag to avoid rebel attack. When a pirate cargo ship with the British flag was seized by the Chinese Marines in Guangdong in an effort to stomp out the opium trade, and when they pulled the British flag down from the ship, it ignited the Second Opium War. It led to the Treaties of Tianjin in 1858. Where China had to pay six million taels of silver as reparations for the expenses of the war, high taxes from the Qing court on its people after the Opium Wars had forced many peasants and farmers off their land. Second, the Punti Hakka Clan Wars. The Punti Hakka Clan Wars were a conflict between the Hakka and the Cantonese people in Guangdong between 1855 and 1867. Hakka literally means guest family, and Punti means natives. The Hakka settled in southern China in a series of migrations. For some time, the local Cantonese and Hakka lived together pretty peacefully, until life became increasingly difficult as the population of Guangdong Province soared. During the Red Turban Rebellion in Guangdong, the hackers helped the Imperial Army raid local villages to kill the rebels and any real or even suspected sympathizers, including villagers who were just forced to pay taxes to the Red Turbans. This precipitated open hostility between the Hakka and Punti, with the Punti attacking Hakka villages in revenge. The wars resulted in roughly a million dead, many more fleeing for their lives, and thousands of villages were destroyed. Those who lived in the Jiangmen city were comparatively poorer than those in places like Guangzhou or Hong Kong. So imagine if you were in this situation. Life is super crappy. When the job notices showed up, many people jumped on the opportunity. A few of the Chinese from Jiangmen City became contractors in the United States, such as Chuck Lee from Taishan. The story goes, Chuck Lee was one of the gold miners who ran his own business after the gold rush. He was commissioned by the Central Pacific Railroad to recruit railroad workers. One day, he showed up back in his hometown in 1865 in a suit, announcing men were needed for work in America, and people lined up. Lee described to his fellow village people America's rich country where gold was everywhere. Those who go there to work for a year or two came back a rich man. Almost no one was able to afford even the cheapest boat ticket to get to the United States. Lee allowed them to repay in payment from the salary. He also promised laborers could send money and letters back home whenever they wanted, and promised to send their bones back to China for when they passed away in unfortunate accidents, which happen more often than we would like. And fast forward to today, Taishan is called the number one overseas Chinese hometown of China. So there you have it. The Chinese that went to the West in the late 1800s and early 1900s were poor immigrants from the Siu region in the Guangdong Province in southern China, trying to just have a less crappy life. Some of them ended up opening and operating the early Chinese restaurants that became the foundation of American Chinese food. So that's it for our quick history lesson. If you like our content, subscribe to our channel. See you soon.